understand who killing the dog was. Uh, well, I just think... Me, uh... What's going on, Mike? How are you today? Good, man. Good. How you doing? I'm good. I got um, I have my in-laws visiting me from New Jersey. Um, it's funny because they lived in Florida years ago, which is kind of a cool story. This whole thing. I mean, it's it's funny how things go around. So Ginny and Herb, that's my in-laws. They live in Jersey. They were totally bummed when we moved down here to Florida. Totally bummed. Because mm-hmm. <clears throat> we lived in Ch- we lived in Chester, New Jersey, three miles apart, and we were always back and forth. So came down here and we're like, yeah, no, I'm not coming down. I, f- I almost feel like they were like, we're not going down. So finally, we got them down here, and it is, you know, it's hot and all that, but uh, it's not that hot. So you know, D. As soon as they arrived, she had wine, cheese. Trying to try and impress him. Took him to a nice restaurant last night. We get tricycles because they're too old for them to ride. My in law, my father in law, he could barely walk. He's like, oh, I can ride bicycles. I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, I'm just working on my one hip. I got I got And it's really funny because he wears, he was in the Naval Academy in, like, I don't know, in the early 60s, late 50s. Oh. And he has a million pins. All over him, all over him. So he's just a walking billboard, like I was a vet. I'm a vet. For everyone that doesn't know, it's uh, today's you know meet a vet day. Um, this is if you remember a couple episodes ago with Boyd. This is one of his good friends, and it's Julius, right? Am I saying Correct. that right? Yep. Okay. Uh, Fogel, and he's a comedian, so I want to get the notice guy. Boom. Uh, one thing I want to tell you guys too. Listen, I gotta sell my Patreon, but the reason I'm gonna sell it, if you haven't seen me live, which I love doing stand-up comedy live, you can watch me on the Patreon page. I I live stream one concert a month. So if you join, if you join um the Patreon now, the fi- it's 15 bucks, but for the 15 bucks. You're only there for one month. Now, with the one month, you get my last comedy special, which is which you can only get on Patreon. You have to join Patreon for one month. And it's 15 bucks. And then at the end of the month, you bail. But with that, you get another live show that I just did. So you have the whole month to check it out. I did it in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, a place called Penn's Peak. Besides the Paramount in Long Island, on my life, I always tell my agent, get me in Penn's Peak. I think it's one of my all-time favorite venues in the whole country. I love that. Door below town. Um, did a lot of improv that night. So go to my Patreon page, download. You pay one month. There's also other podcasts on there where you, the subscriber, you, right there, you, you get to be the podcast and you know what's amazing i think we've done about god for us it's probably 20 how many podcasts we do already not that many right Mike? uh this will be 28 um you have you're in the 30s i believe for your there, patreon ones yeah what's more mind-boggling about the patreon podcast is you the fan you the subscriber you're the you're the podcast host but every single one's been completely so far and wide from the other that's what absolutely boggles my mind you mentioned that you're playing what is it the 27th you're playing at the paramount yeah uh you're gonna meet up with dice i think he's playing the day before you is he really? <laughs> yeah, he's going to be there 26th. So he's going to be there on a Thursday night. Yeah. Yeah, cuz well, he's I've doing played. he's doing that um that Carteret place the night before on Wednesday on the 25th. Did you get to see him? 
No, um, I th- we might be going to see him on that Wednesday, the 25th, because Annie really wants me to meet him, and I haven't met him yet, so it should be uh, interesting. I mean, come on, Annie. <laughs> Why don't you bring Mike come down the Paramount and just, you know, come on. We, who you going to go see, okay? Let's, let's get rid of it, okay? I... <laughs> I used to have him, he, he he used to come on my radio show once in a while. He didn't have to do that. He was so damn funny every time I had him. He's just, he's just a funny dude. I know he's playing, he's playing down here in Naples. Well, for those of you, for those of you watching on Patreon, he plays tonight. For those of you not watching on Patreon, he played last night in Naples, Florida. And actually he's playing tonight and tomorrow night as well in Naples, Florida. But, uh, I didn't know he was playing the paramount. I would love to maybe, you know what? We'll definitely go check him out because I fly in on a Thursday and I have hotel rooms for Thursday, Friday, Saturday out in long Island for me, Joe Sib and Monty Franklin. Um, I'm going to film both those shows and, you know, we'll air them here and we'll, Aaron on Patreon, and we got a whole thing figured out for that. So, yeah, I'll stop to go see the dice, man. Okay. I want to see what material. I don't know what kind of material he does anymore. I'm more I have curious. no idea. <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious, like, does he still walk out with the, with, the, with the jacket? Is he still, you know, with the fake cigarette? Like, I don't know. Or does he just go up there and, and do his shtick? That's, that's, uh, that's what I want to kind of find out. Annie says she believes he still does the jacket, the vest, the vest or whatever. Jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, actually. Why, why, why don't we all go there on a Thursday night? Why don't we all go there? Why don't we try to get him on here? That would be great. Annie, why don't we you can work make that happen? What, 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 let's try to get him on. Brewer wants oh. to get Dice on. I'm already working on it. She's working on it. Do you think he'd be into that? I guess we'll find yeah, out. Especially if he meets them this week. Yeah, uh, totally. If if you meet up with him um, when you guys are in Huntington, you guys can, you know, a hundred percent seal that I'm, deal. I'm definitely gonna go see him in Huntington. When I I had no clue he was there on that Thursday night before I'm there on the Friday. It's that, funny too, because uh, when we were in um, when I followed you in Annapolis when you were there, and I was with you and Sib, uh, yeah. you guys. You were you were having some, I guess, family issues with one of your children, and you were going off um, as if you were dice. Always. And I hold on a second. Here, I have this. I have. Big you fucking fuck. mistake. <laughs> I have an audio clip of you going. Big fucking mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I got that all on video. <laughs> when I. Why did you air that? What, what, what's on there? That's on you, man. If you want me to post it up, I can. I'll, I'll send it to you to uh, to verify it really? first, just to make yeah. sure that you want to put it out there. I but it is I it is pretty funny. If I remember, it was something like my kid was going over someone else's kid's house, and the parent wasn't really there. Yeah, that's what but it was. Yep, girlfriend was there. The girlfriend that's like was pregnant, and it was something. It was something in that world. And, yeah, and you and, called the dad. I actually, I, I have all dad, that on. I have dad, that all recorded. Yeah, <laughs> and the dad's like, yeah, you know, uh, we just kind of play loosey goosey and uh, whatever goes, and. And they were like, yeah, that's a big fucking mistake. <laughs> we, me, and, me and Sib, I do dice all the, I do a terrible dice, but I do dice reacting to things all the time. Annie doesn't even know whenever she texts me uh-huh. or, or if she calls, I respond to her without her knowing as if I'm dice. So like, come on, Annie, you want me to really do I mean, Come on, honey. I'm not. I'm not. Do- I'm not doing it. I'm a dice man. I was in the garden. Come on. 
Annie, how's this my guy? Come on. Who, who is this guy? Is he, is he doing good by you, Annie? That's pretty much spot on what he he says to her about yeah. me. <laughs> Who's this my guy? Is he, I mean, what, what's he doing? He, computers? How uh, far as computers go, Annie? Come on. By the way, I want to say a major thank you to Joe Rogan uh, and Doug Stanhope. I had people reaching out to me going, yo, Doug Stanhope was on Rogan and Rogan complimented you like with such kindness talking about your shows and your stand up and all that. So thank you, Joe. And thank you, Doug Stanhope. So today we have a comedian, never met him, um, but I like, like we said, I like, hey, let's get to know a, a vet at least once a month, let the world know and discover all different sides of the military, the vet, who they are, what they do, and all that jazz. Because I don't think there's um, a bit, you know, the, the vets seem to, I, I, I have family, they're not blood, but they, the ones I know seem to understand each other and they stick to each other where the general public really doesn't get it. So I like checking out and meeting new people and meeting vets. And today, um, why don't you introduce who's coming on here today there, Mike? So we have today Julius Fogel, who is a retired vet. He also was a boxer, an American boxer. Another uh, boxer. Yes. Yes. So this should be awesome. All right. um, and he uh, wrote an autobiography that you can check out. Uh, and then after he retired from the army and from boxing, he became a stand-up comedian. So let's bring him on, My Mr. Guy. Julius Fogel. What's up, Julius? Hey, what's going on, man? Glad to be here, man. Yeah, Thanks, I already man. know I would, stand by. I already know I would not want to box you just by looking at you. I can already, <laughs> you got a boxer head and arms. I could already tell. There was go there yeah, there was one thing I want to say when he was uh, introducing me about as far as me doing the comedy and the boxing. I actually, yeah. um, well, I'll get into that real quick. Um, I, was Go ahead. With the, I was dealing with depression, and um, that's when I started writing. So it took two years to write the book, but during those two years, I started doing comedy in the middle. So when you, when you were dealing with depression, what, if you don't mind me asking, what what was most of the depression about? Was it was it your personal life? Was it things that you've been through that you couldn't shake off? It's, I get it. It's, um, it's it was several things combined, but uh, things that were going through, getting ready to retire from the army, also um, you know getting ready my boxing career coming to an end, you know. So that was like two different things that were gone. You know, I, you know, I lost my mother in two thousand. Um, mm. Oh wow, and that's always that's always been rough. So every Mother's Day is always a rough day. So it was just a bunch of things combined, relationship issues and all that just combined way just where, um, you know, a lot of people that see me never saw they, you know, ever noticed anything. But that's how yeah. you know, I tell people just because you don't, you see things doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that that's what it is. So, Julius, where, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in New York and Texas. New York and Texas? And Texas. Yeah, my, um, my parents split up when I was nine years old and... We moved to Texas where my mother was from. My father was from the East Coast, New York, you know, uh, South Carolina, though, that area. So the whole East Coast is pretty much where my father's family is from. My mother's side is basically all in Houston, Texas. And then, so how old are you when you go to Texas? You're, you're nine years old. You go to Texas mm -hmm. with your mom. Yep. So you don't get to see dad a whole lot, I assume. No, um, not until we actually uh, moved back. We moved back to New York for a little while in, um, in like 1985. So a couple of years. There. I talk about that in the book. I don't want to give too much of the book away, though. It was kind of my, my um, growing up, my childhood was kind of very erratic. It's a lot of moving around. And it's you. I mean, the book is, is an incredible read, I think. And it, uh, okay. it explains all that. All right. What is the name of the book? The book is called The Last Round. The Last Round. Yeah. And so when you join the service, because I noticed when I talk to you, everyone joins service for different reasons. Some people join them for education. Mm -hmm. Some people join because they want to travel the world. Depending if you were around during 9-11, some people felt the need 
to join at that time. What what made you go into the service? At the time, I was working at Little Caesars as a assistant manager for a couple of years, and um, I was like, that's not what I wanted to do. I really wasn't really hooked on the Army, but I had a bad relationship with a stepdad, and I just said, you know what, I'm ready to get up out of here and just do it my way, and that's that's how I got into it. And then once you were in there, you travel everywhere. Did you have to – did you – but then but the you were in there a long time. Is that a career thing? Yeah, 20, I did 20 years, 10 days. Damn. Yeah, so I, re I retired in 2010. Damn, how old are you? I'm, I, I'm 50. Damn, you've already lived a whole life. So well, you just yeah. starting. Well, you know, I, well, I just retired from boxing around eight years ago. I was still boxing in, in my 40s. I fought uh, Sergey Kovalev. No kidding. Yeah, I fought him as a pro, yeah. And what, what, um, damn, I actually you know, tell, I actually tell a joke about that. Uh, in the first round, I say he hit me with a right hand so, so hard that he actually knocked some damn sense in my ass. Uh, <laughs> that's, 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 when I, that's when I knew it was time he started looking for another occupation. <sighs> Jesus, what was your um career record at the end As of the day? An amateur, I, was, I started late. I didn't like when I joined the army in 1990, I didn't turn, I didn't start boxing. The first time I put a pair of gloves on my hands at all was in 1993. So I was in the Army like three years. And, um, you know, I went to all Army a couple of years and lost. And finally, like my third year is when I won it. And I won, it, I won all Army and Armed Forces seven straight years. So I was the um, 2002, I was the U.S. Uh, middleweight national champion. And that felt good, didn't it? Yes, yes. Felt good. <laughs> it felt really good. Who was some... Um... So growing up, because we're kind of, you know, I'm 55. When it came to boxers. I thought I was older than you, man. No, nah, man. Okay, you like, got me by a few. I've got you by a few. Okay. But I, I grew up, I felt like the golden era of boxing. I could be wrong because I don't follow it anymore. But I, I grew up with Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Hagler, uh, Hagler Hearns, um, the, uh, Foreman. Ken Norton. Oh, I didn't lie. Uh, yes, yes. I loved one of my all time favorites was um, Hagler, and I'm still traumatized that he lost to Sugar yeah. Ray. I loved Sugar Ray, but I loved I loved Hagler more. I really loved Hagler. I thought he would take Hagler him was off. mean. He was mean. He had a mean streak in him. He had a mean streak in him. He had a mean streak in him. And Tommy Hearns, he can hit hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Usually, a lot of boxers that are like tall, lanky, have broad shoulders. They usually punch hard. It's not usually the muscle bound. Like I used to spar with a lot of guys and box guys, and when they look real muscular like that, I used to love it because it's like they don't have the same quick twitch muscle fiber. Right. You know. Right. But, you know. Then they squeeze. Now some of them do though. Like Tyson was a hard puncher, but Tyson was just naturally built like that. I don't think Tyson touched the weight at all. But Holyfield kind of built his body and transformed into a, you know, a solid heavyweight. Do you think? I saw the end of Ali, but I can honestly say I'm not sure anyone if, – if you took everyone in their prime, do you think anyone could have beat Tyson while he was peaking and everyone else was peaking, including Muhammad Ali? Muhammad Ali beats Tyson. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. My, my, Mike Tyson even says that. He says, man – I know he does. He said, well, he was willing to die in there. He said, man, I was, it wasn't that important. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I don't know. You I'm know, gonna, what? I'm going to bite your ear off first, you know. <laughs> I, I think, I, I think when he first said that, I felt like he was just humble and he was showing great respect. And I, and the more, he, he I don't keeps, know. Yeah, he keeps That's, saying it. So, I mean, I'm thinking he is really convinced about that. Yeah, he might be. And he's, he's a different, He's a type of guy I'd love to sit down and talk to for an hour. I, I, always, I, will, I hope to do it one day myself. I mean, that's a fascinating human being to go to see the trials of his life. You were you want to talk about fighting yeah. some demons. The transformation. He, the transformation of the demons he fought and the amount of demons that were surrounding him trying to take him down and what he prospered from, from what he came from. I, I think he's one of the I, I got to say, I think he's one of the greatest warriors in, in life that have just went through all the valleys, every valley. 
I think right now this is probably the happiest he's been in his life, though, too. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, just by – and like I said, I don't know anything about him. I just always go by – you look at the person, you listen to the way they talk. Yeah. W- what is w- what is their intention when they speak? He's got a – He's got a really good, beautiful message now. He really does. And I did enjoy seeing him smack around the guy at the plane. I'm not going to lie. That was <laughs> that I could watch. <laughs> um, so now you're doing, you're doing stand-up. What is, is this, how do you get, how do you transform at your age going Man. into stand-up? Like who, who talked you into it? Or is that something you were already frustrated about and you always wanted to do? Um, it's kind of crazy because, I mean, a lot of things I have did in my life were just things that were kind of like just a hunch. Like even like joining the military. It's like one day I just said, I'm going to join the Army. You know, and then, um, you know, I told myself one day, I was, you know, because I can sometimes, a lot of times I think if I see something and I yeah. think I look at it, I'm like, you know what? I think I can do that pretty good, you know, if I apply myself. And then, I, you know, I'll try it. You know, um, and I, you know, like even, yeah. even with comedy right now, I can hear a voice, like from a say a celebrity, and usually as soon as I hear it, I, I think, okay, I can, I can, I can uh, imitate that, you know. So, so I boxing, so I got into it. Um, I started, um, you know, I took some butt whippings along the way, um, but then I had my first knockout on my twenty third birthday in St. Louis, and I oh was, damn, I was hooked. That was it. I think. You know, I tried, I started going into it and I, the amount, the, the amount of cardio just to spar. Yeah. For, I remember sparring for the first time. I think I lasted 45 seconds, 45 <laughs> seconds. Even just the defense, I, could, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get my lungs. I, went, oh, I, gotta, I gotta jog for another, I gotta get up my stamina for at least another another 10 minutes before I can even jump back into that. It's, yeah. it, you gotta be a true athlete, but yeah. Well, first. you know, you gotta be in shape too in a workout. You just definitely need it though. But as you start learning it, you understand it's more about the mental because uh, a lot of guys, you know, when a fight's getting really heated, they, um, you know, they pretty much hyperventilate. They don't know how to relax. I, I've, I've learned even as I got older, when I learned how to relax in the ring, I was able to go eight rounds when I was like, when I was 23, I'm like, man, I don't see how these guys are fighting 12 rounds and 10 rounds like that. But it's basically just a mental a place you have to take yourself to. It's kind of like if you run a marathon, if you can do one mile, you can do two. If yeah. You can do two, you can do three. So you got to kind of just, what you're really trying to get is where you can recover in that minute's time. If you can recover, if your recoverability is good enough because you have that stamina and you're in shape like that, then, as soon as that second bell, that, that round two starts, you, you've already recharged. Right. That's, and, and that's why in boxing, a lot of times you see guys will have a second and third win. They look be a little tired in the sixth round, but then the eighth round, you're like, whoa, where did this come from? <laughs> right. Yeah. He got he, he dove deep within. But you got to push yourself in training in. to be able to do that because that's how you, you fight during, um, you know, when you're having that heart at that stress level. What was your, what was the, that, that you have that one victory or that one moment, whether it was a victory or not, whether you thought everyone thought you were going to get knocked out or, or, you know, like baseball, I go to camp every year, but I still remember the three biggest plays over the last seven years that I relive over and over my head. Is it that first knockout? What, what, what do you relive over in your head in the boxing? Um, that was it. Um, that knockout. That's, I, I would say I have about three of those moments. Um, winning uh, the U.S. Championships in 2002, the amateur title. That was that was one. Also, um, I won a minor belt as a pro. Um, it wasn't one of the four major sanctioned bodies. I won the IBC Americas uh, title. That's my championship. Damn. Is that? Yeah, right there. Oh damn. Oh damn. Yeah, and that was in uh, 2005. So, um, and I won that in my ninth, ninth, uh, bout. I had a um, second round knockout, uh, over Isaiah Henderson. Mm. So now, you know, it's amazing. Just like the, now I would assume when you went in it, you're in it to, to, to go all the way. You're not there just as a career. 
you want to make it to the top. And I'm, I'm just assuming I'm just having this little conversation with you. You're probably convinced you can, you can make it to a title bout. Is that, is that true to say about you? It was kind of tough because I was still in the army. So I'm working full time. I was a recruiter at the time mm. and those guys worked long hours. So, you know, I'm not, I wasn't getting the sparring that I needed. Um, mm. I had to spar with heavyweights cause we didn't really have anybody that was at the, you know, the same skill level around my weight class. Mm. So, um, I really, I wasn't getting in spar. I was basically training myself, getting up, running in the morning before I got to be to work. So I already knew really in my mind, I had made it up that I, I could only go for so far with this type of, you know, going against guys who that's all they do is train. They go rest. I'm still, you know, working all day. So, um, you know, I was realistic. I said, what I did say, I said, I wanted to win a belt and I did want a belt, but I, you know, yes, I wasn't, wasn't the IBC or the WBA, WBF, you know, but you know, I'm cool with my career. I, start, I mean, I, I turned pro when I was 32. Mm. So I was up there. Well, I'm, I, you know, my career is very similar, meaning, you know, in my head, I thought, oh, I'm going to be working with this and doing that. And technically, I did. Um, you know, like, oh, I did get to work with this one. Or it did. it's never quite what you visualize. But when you do, what I noticed was when you reach that moment in time, like, you know what? I, I reached so much further than I ever anticipated. And I'm very happy what I accomplished. It's a, uh, and then you're off to the next thing. Uh, and it seems like that's what the world you're going for now. So after the boxing, you're not even thinking about stand-up, or you're already starting to think about it. Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, I've always liked comedy, been a big fan of it. So who's your guys? Who are you watching that already made you excited? Where you're like, oh, this guy, say, that uh, guy. You know, I mean, I watched the comments because Richard Pryor would be the first one that kind of got me as far as. Hands down the greatest. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. That first one, that yeah. first concert where it was Richard Pryor live, when he comes out and right out of the gate, he's the guy's trying to take a picture of him. You saw that one? He yeah. Tried to picture, he's like, sit your ugly ass <laughs> that you know you ain't got no film in that seat and he talks about the white people as like, i like when white people find out somebody took their seats so he's sitting there that whole concert i still say is probably one of the greatest comedy concerts in history and not to take away from chris rock anyone as far as humor and truth and and you see his you see his heart, you see his phone a bit, dude. I'm all with you with Richard Pryor. That is, to me, he's the greatest. Yeah, I want, I want that, that same special that you're talking about. I watched that at my granddad's house. We was, me and my brother was spending the night in his house. My, my granddad had a studio apartment and he had a pull out bed. So we would sleep on a pull out bed, but this was the day before you had remote controls. So you had to get up and turn that knob. It went through like eight. Yes. One through, one through 13 and eight. Through yes. Eight. So uh, yes. my granddad was watching that Richard Pryor special and I'm in the bed listening to it and I'm just, I'm man, I'm laughing and stuff. My granddad didn't say nothing until the next morning. He was like, boy, I thought something was wrong with you. All that shaking in the bed you <laughs> was doing last night. <laughs> there's so many bits in that that I still recite over and over. There, there's a, he does, there ain't no racism in dogs. He says, he says I got this new pony and and he goes, and the, I, don't know, I think that the Doberman said, let's go say hello to new dog. But then that horse smell hit the ass. And he said, hey, this ain't no goddamn dog. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to fuck it. And he said, he said there's, oh, my God. So Richard Pryor, he's a biggie. Who else? Eddie Murphy will be the next one, I think, that I kind of jumped on. We are neck and neck. We're neck and neck. I was convinced I was going to be the white Eddie Murphy. I wanted, I wanted a full blown uh, leather outfit. Mm -hmm. And to this day, too, delirious. I got to see that live. I was, I think, a 17, 18 year old kid. It was before he filmed it. And I saw him doing um, delirious before it came out. He was with, um, what was that for Beverly Hills Cop? They did the music in it. Um, 
they were opening up for him. It was, uh, that, yes. That's thing of, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. All right. So that was my two stars. You had Pryor, Eddie Murphy, a little bit of Carlin. Yeah. Um, I liked Carlin as I got older, although he got, yeah. he got pretty, he got pretty angry, but the stuff he was saying, I was like, Oh shit. It was deep. Yeah, it was deep. I was like, whoa, he's uh, he's coming from a whole different angle here. That is Sam Kinison when he yeah. first came out. When he first came out, blew my mind. I never saw anything like that. But then it got, you know, it turned into something else. So when's your first gig on stage? When did you start going on? Uh, it was probably around 2015, the end of 2014, I think it was. And it was it was horrible, you know. It was terrible. <laughs> Which you you did in Texas? It was yeah. It was in Houston at the Improv. Oh, the um, Improv in Houston. Okay. Yeah, and the way they were doing it this at this time, like the comedians who were like up and coming that you didn't know who they were, they were like at the last end of the list, right? So it's almost like midnight. Oh, nobody's in there, man. And I'm oh, telling shit, you, they just, and then I couldn't remember anything. I, it was just it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, what made you go back? Um, just, I guess I like challenge, you know, even when I first started boxing, it was a challenge. Somebody said, well, man, you know, we had just won the post basketball championship and, um, I hit the game winning shot at the buzzer and the, the guy that was a uh, charge of quarters, he said, well, since y'all are so bad, why don't y'all go get in that boxing smoker next, next month? And oh, I got damn. a smoker and ended up winning that. And that's how I started boxing. Oh, damn. So it just, it just was a challenge. And even with like with the comedy, I wasn't really, I didn't have the aspirations of being a, a great comic or anything when I first started I was just I think it was just something I was venting using you know using as a platform just using it to help with depression at that time mm. and uh you know the more and more I started doing I'm like okay I'm okay I'm all right you know I mean and now I mean I just enjoy it it's a, I, I love doing it I, I mean so it's just um it's nothing like my my definition of, of peace is just being able to do something that you love and, and get paid to do it I mean that's I mean that's what it's all about that's, um, I keep telling my kids that, I don't know if they listen, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very simple way of living. It's, it's, it's bizarre that people like you and I, and I guess maybe it's an age thing. A lot of us don't learn it till much later in life. Yeah. So have you been able to, with the standup, are you able to, are you working up in the ranks? And forgive me for asking. And if I don't know, I, I highly apologize. Like, Jim, well, well, I'm well, touring. Must not uh, how do you not know I'm touring the, the freaking bowl? Like, oh, shit. Sorry, man. No, I'm not. I'm not touring or anything. I haven't blew up like that or anything like that yet. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing shows. I got a show this Friday coming up. Um, Where are you playing? It's, uh, this is, it's an African uh, restaurant. So it's, what? It's here in Houston, though. Okay. It's here in Houston, though. So, um, you know, um, I've I've been at the Improv. I've done a couple shows at the Joke Joint before. Um, before they closed that down. So I'm still swinging. And I had a, another issue I had to overcome. I had a severe stage fright phobia. I'm talking about like panic attacks, or even in the military, speaking in front of audiences. So it took a while just to even get over that part of it. Mm. You know, I'm on stage sweating. I mean, just everything. So, um. Once I got that handled, you know, I started, you know, just started, keep, kept grinding. And, um, you know, the more you do something, you'll get better at it. And, um, you know, I'm just enjoying it right now. And I'm going to keep, I'm going to see where it takes. Me. I have a couple friends, you know, I have these, I have a guy that opens for me. He's in his fifties. He's only been doing it. Eh, maybe seven, eight years or so. It's one of those things where it doesn't matter what your age is. Mm -hmm. What I learned, the minute you find your voice and your vulnerability, the minute you find your vulnerability and you're willing to share that with the world, it's, it's, you start growing, I feel, as a comedian to a whole new level. And then you start, I mean, you're a guy that has pretty much lived everything. And when I say everything, 
Your whole journey as a kid, you went through anger, you went through the family breaking up, you went into the service, you were a boxer, and you made a champ. You probably thought at that time, like, I'm going to, like, you're like, oh, it's not going to happen. Oh, God, I'm going to die. Oh, it's not really going to happen. And I just learned the more vulnerable I am on stage, the more people are able to relate to me. And it just, I, I, you know, I've been doing this almost, God, Julius, I've been doing this since 89, 89. And I can honestly say not until the last eight years, maybe have, did I feel like, wow, I, now I know, and now I really know what I'm doing. I really know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but it takes a long time, man. Yep. And I, I think about what we're just saying basically is saying is you have to know yourself. You know, a lot of yes. times people don't even accept that they have vulnerabilities. That's you know, right. So if you don't even accept it, how can you really, you know, you, you have you're not gonna you're not gonna get there. Yes, yeah. And I can usually see through it. I can usually sit there and just I'll watch someone and go, uh, oh, this guy's been doing it. He's not ready yet. He's still trying to be sticky or this and that. And he's not ready to, uh, okay. Oh, this guy's real getting real close. I remember watching a couple guys and then sure enough, I see them a year or two later going, Oh shit, he's blowing up. I knew that guy's going to blow up because they found what they're not so worried to talk about anymore. Um, you know, do you find it? Do you do a podcast? Yeah, we have one on Sunday. It's called Soul Therapy. It's uh, me and a comedian named uh, Mayan, Mayan Robinson. And it comes on from 6 to 8 on Sundays, uh, Central Standard Time. And now, is, don't you think it's amazing at this, at this stage? Because we, we both grew up in a different era. And we, things had to be done differently in the way people, pretty much anyone could be an entertainer now and the whole world is at your feet. I mean, you pro should I assume that you and your, you on the um, Sundays, do you have more fun doing that than the actual stand up? <sighs> it's about the same. It's different I world. Think it's, I think, I think I feel like I have a little more control in the studio though. Well, you, well you do have, you know, because you can yeah. write, you know, just a little bit, but it's, I think they're both pretty much hand in hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they are. They're just two different beasts. So I tell everyone, listen, on stage, I'm not going to talk. I'm coming out. I'm coming out to knock your teeth out. I, I go for the kill. I don't want, <laughs> I want to hurt you. I want to destroy you. I want you to leave going, you know, now I saw so and so and so and so and so and so, but no one touches him. Yeah. The podcast world and the other worlds I do, it's more of, I'd rather reach to you as a human. Um, not that I don't do that with stand up, but I'd, I'd much rather, <laughs> I'm not afraid to show this anymore. Yeah. I'm not afraid to talk about faith, my spirituality, how deep we can go, how dark I used to be. Just put it all out there. Everyone's got something to relate to. Yeah. And that's, that's the powerful thing about having a voice and, and people like yourself that's able to put it out there. Um, so when should we look for this book? Is it out now? Yeah, here there's a copy right here. Uh, it's called The Last Round. Let's see it. Bing, bang, boom. So we won't talk about that. Everyone should check out this book. It's now available on Amazon. On Amazon. Amazon, yeah. What about a website? I don't have it on the website yet, but I'm going to get on that. Choice. <laughs> hey, I know. I'm. I'm. Hey, I'm working on. It. How old? How old's the? <laughs> how old's? How old's your partner on the podcast? Is young dude? She no, it's a female. She. Oh, she. Um, yeah. She. I'm not sure. I think she has to be about probably about forty. She got kids. Yep. Forty. Teenagers. Huh? Teenagers. No, they grown. You need to find yourself. The two of you, I'm going to give you the best advice you ever had in your life. Find a teenager to run all your social media. And you'll never have to worry about this again. The minute you find someone to run your social media, 
build a website and you talk about it every Sunday on your podcast. Go to here, put your book on there. Talk about the thing. Have a little kid going, okay, Julius, you got to, I just need you to make a little video and I'll post it and I'll, I'll tweet it out and I'll do this and I'll do it. Dude, it changed my life. It was a game changer. Because guys like you and me, it's not a world. I need a, I need a guy. Yeah. I, I, my, I need daughter a guy. Has, my daughter's 16. She helps me out with a lot of this stuff, though. So. There you go. Yeah. Get her working more. Throw her some extra bang, bang, bang. Yeah. She has to do less chores, pay a little extra cash, <laughs> and let daddy roll. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I hope to cross paths with you on the road, man. What was that? I hope to cross paths with you. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. I'm, I look forward to it, man. It'd be great. I mean, I was, well, it's kind of funny how I remember watching you in Half Baked, and now all of a sudden I'm talking. I mean, you just never know how you how your roller coaster ride is going to go. And that's what I'm saying. That you never know where this. This is what I love about life's journey. You don't know where it goes. You don't know what, and we don't know why we're here. Yeah. At the end of the day, you might be here to save one human being. From that, you talked about depression. You 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 went through some serious stuff that you haven't unleashed today, but I can just tell. And <laughs> you're gonna change yeah, a you you got, yeah, you're gonna change a lot of lives, man. Yeah. Well, actually, did you um boy that did um I don't did he speak about the be heard campaign? Say what? The be the be heard campaign. No, tell me about that. It has to do with mental health and, uh, you know, it's called uh, Hearing, Encouraging, Recognizing, and Discussing. And it's a program that, um, you know, that they're doing because Sean Porter's in that movie called Round One where he talks about his relationship with his father and dealing with a lot of things that he was dealing with. So um, it's, it's a campaign, it's a movement that's going on now called Be Heard, H-E-R-D. H-E-R-D. We'll have to check into that. We should, we should get some people from there and get more involved with that. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah, especially with veterans too, man. I mean, a lot of time. I mean, just just leaving the military, going into the back into this billion world again, is, is hard on a lot of people. But then, actually, for me to lose, you know, boxing and retirement from the army, it was it was a little rough, you know. And plus, that was kind of the only world you knew. Yeah. You know, so to leave to leave that world. Time, my whole time in the army, I was planning on moving back home, which I did. But you know what? I planned on my mother still being here, so that was you know. Things happening that you have no control over. You got to make the best out of. Yeah, man, you went through losing a mom, and you and your mom clearly were close because you went to go live with her. Ain't nothing with a boy. There ain't nothing more. Well, I shouldn't say that. I was very close to my dad, but uh oh, someone's cooking some shit. You better jump on that, Julius. Man, goddamn. <laughs> Go do what you got to do. You, you, you know a, what? Car, you had a car wreck and not a smoke alarm going off in here. That's right. Someone telling us we can wrap this up. Man, God bless you, brother. Be safe. Oh, you too, man. Take care. I'll see you around. Great to talk to you. Stay out of trouble. All right. Will do. You too. Later, man. Bye. Says Jules, you know, I could tell he had a lot. He had a lot he wanted to talk about, but just wasn't sure how far and how wide to go. Um, we should look into that. Mike, that organization he was talking about. Um, I just want to get involved. You know, I was talking with James, and um, I just feel like there's a festival or something that we can get going and just organize and let the vets do it. But me and me and Sib have been trying to put some stuff together, and we're still. It takes a little time, but uh, we're slowly working on it. Slowly working on it. Um, we'll catch up a little later, Mikey, stay out of trouble. Always. I want to get into, um, I want to get into some stuff, you know, again, I want to let everyone know, beware of everything that's heading our way. Remember me and Eddie Bravo talked about even JP, the times are coming. If you can't see how obvious it is, I don't know how to help you. If you can't start seeing everything, whatever's controlling us, government, media, whatever their ties are, they keep pushing for race. They keep pushing now it's the abortion thing. It's just, 
It is a nonstop carnival to keep you separated. And if you believe this, well, then you have to be on that camp. If you believe that, it's like coming up, what, what do you believe in? Okay, then you stand over there and you go join that team and put on the jersey. What do you believe in? All right, go stand over there and wear that, blah, blah, blah. It's so obvious. How do you not see it yet? It, it boggles my mind. I said it two weeks ago. Here come the race riot. Here come the shootings. Here come the... It's just... It, you start to see the cycles, and it's the same thing over. Oh, women's rights. You know, here's the thing. I can, I can, I can, if we're going to take abortion right here, and a lot of assholes just puckered up, but let's just talk because it's not a political subject. At the end of the day, it's not a political subject, it's a human subject. And the real issue is, We've been dehumanized, dehumanized visually by every uh, pop star, by movies, by pornography, to look at the most precious thing we could do as humans, and that is to create another human, to fall in love, to be together, your souls connect and you reach a point that you have a child. Everything is sex. Sex is soulless. Do you understand that? It's soulless. And the more you take the soul out and the more you dehumanize, my body, my choice, you are selling yourself short when you say those things. My body, my choice. It's, it's no different than saying Kellogg's is good for your heart. I know some people's minds are exploding, but it's a sales pitch. It's a thoughtless sales pitch. The real issue in hand is you need to respect your body more. You need to respect one another more. And you need to respect if you're going to be intimate someone, stop watching those demonic, disturbing pornography of women getting choked. And how many, how many, how many TikToks do you see where chicks are twerking their ass? We've become... And we've taught our children and society, you know, your every, every, every single entertainer sells their asshole. That's all they sell. They sell their asses shaking up and down. They sell their boobs. They sell sexual. They're not dancing. They're strippers. They're glorified strippers. And if you can't, the more and more you fall into that trap, the more you fall into this madness that everyone's under a spell of. <laughs> my body, my choice. Let's rip that apart. You're taking a chance with another human being and you are allowing someone to enter your body before you even get there. You should hold how valuable that moment is rather than treating yourself like meat. You can't treat yourself like meat and have someone treat you like meat and then scream, my body, my dad. It's very reckless. It's deeper than my body, my choice. Nobody talks about preventing the situation in a real manner, or the value of what intimacy truly is supposed to be. And you can call it old fashioned, you can call it whatever you want, but nature, even, even if you look at nature, they produce and they move on. And it's up to the girl 
You can't just grit. You know, monkey can't just grab a female monkey and start going at it. That female monkey will let you know, like, yeah, nah. A lion. The lion can't roll up on a female lion and get all up in there. They decided to let's do this. And they know why they're doing it. They're not doing it to bust a nut. They're doing it to create life. To create life. And if you can't handle that deepness, you can't come in the game and shout your mouth. That's just an opinion. You got to respect your body in a deeper soul way. But that's the hoopla Houdini thing they do to us. It's my body, my choice. My body, my choice. Women's rights. Women's rights. Stop with that. Get out of the circus. So you're not controlled, so you're not running, so you're not running around with a picket sign, you're not coloring your hair because it represents a thing, you're not, you know, LGBTQ2, enough of all that. It's time to say enough of that, let's, deep, let's go to the deeper layer. Time to find the deeper layer, what it's all truly about. This word rights is out of control, racism, it's all out of control. Turn it all off so you can clear your mind. Get rid of the emotions and you can see it for what it's worth. So before you jump into any parade, sit down and analyze the whole thing. And does this change your life where you're at at that particular time? Um, I really enjoyed the day. I'm going to get this uh, script together. I'm going to Surprise Arizona this week. And uh, I love playing Arizona. And then we're playing Long Island, the Paramount. Make sure you're there for those shows. Those are going to be hot shows. I'm bringing all the openers. We're going to film them for something uh, I'm going to launch this summer. And, um, yeah, got my tire fixed, and I'm in a good mood, and we're going to enjoy the day. And we're going to have uh, – and I hope you do the same. Go to jimbrew.com for all tour dates, and we'll catch up soon. Mike, good talking to you. Jim, real quick. Yeah. Um, so we, Annie and I, have been trying to reach the contest winner from guess how much Jim spent on a week in Belize. And you couldn't get him? We can't get him. So, I mean, it's up to you. Do you want to give us another week to reach out to this person? Yeah. Or do we'll you want to move on? We'll give him a week and then we'll move on. You okay, because I already have a list of people who, who are next. On okay, no problem. That. So we'll no give him another week. We'll try him again. And uh, if not, we'll move on to the next person. Move on to the next one. All good. All right, cool. brother. Be good. You too, dude. Talk to you soon. Yep, yep. Hey, this is Jim Brewer, and I got my own Patreon page, and hopefully you'll check it out. Live comedy concert streamed once a month. Weekly, you host your own podcast, and you interview me. Early access to the Bruniverse podcast every single week. And that bonus footage and bonus segments. And you get to access my last comedy special, Somebody How to Say It. There's a lot there. I promise you I'm not going to let you down. Go check out my official Jim Brewer Patreon page. And I'll see you there.